Greetings and welcome back to 303 Senior English A. And we are continuing our conversation with Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, the general prologue. Let's go ahead and write that down in our login information if we don't have it there. The general prologue. We are looking now and continuing to look now at the list of characters who will constitute Chaucer's traveling entourage. That group of people that Chaucer invents who he says he met at the tabard, a, a, a bar in London, on his way to go on holy pilgrimage. You can already sense the irony, as we've said before, let me get this straight. I was going to go on a religious holy pilgrimage, but before I left, I had to go to the bar, where I met some other people who also had to go to the bar before they went on holy pilgrimage, and they invited me to come along. Again, it's all a contrivance by Chaucer, but it's part of that kind of wonderful Chaucerian irony that is going to be such an important part of reading Canterbury Tales. Now, we have been outlining a number of these characters, and I'm with you in your hymnal on page 104. We are now going to look at a, a, a group of individuals who uh, we will list first, and then we will come to each one of them. As we've pointed out, in your hymnal, each time we meet a new character, they have italicized that character for you. Let's go ahead real quickly and just forecast the individuals that we'll be working with, starting with the merchant on page 104 and ending with the wife of Bath. So let's list who we will be meeting here in our study. As we've already mentioned on page 104 at line 280, we will meet the merchant. Then at line 295, we will meet the cleric. And some of you will say, it makes sense to just kind of write these down at level one and then skip three lines in between each one. And then I'm just going to write down three things I want to remember about each one of these characters, and then I'm ready for the examination, right? So again, you'll write down the merchant, skip three lines. The Oxford cleric on line 295, skip three lines. The next one will be on page 105, the sergeant at the law, uh, line 319, line 319. We will meet on page 106, a Franklin on page 340 or on line 341. We will then on page 106 meet um, several individuals, but they will be treated as a unit, and so can you. You can simply call them the Guild Fraternity. They are there starting at line 371. A haberdasher, a dyer, a carpenter, a weaver, a carpet maker. Okay, and this is what we'll call the guild fraternity. We'll get to that in a moment. Then over on page 107, very briefly, we meet the cook at line um, 389. We meet the skipper at line 398 on page 107. We meet the doctor on page 108 at the top there, uh, line 421. And finally, for our session today, we will be meeting then the worthy woman from beside Bath City at line 455. We normally will call her, along with Chaucer, the wife of Bath. Why? Well, we'll get into it when we study, of course, about this woman. But the big thing about her is that she loves to be married. She hates to be married. She will say later, marriage is both a misery and a woe. I should know. I've been married five times, and all five of my husbands have died, and I'm waiting for my sixth one to appear. We'll get to this famous wife of Bath. We'll meet her for the first time in the general prologue, and that will take us over to page 109. So that kind of forecasts for you where we're headed. Now, again, just to remind... Obviously, I've given other lectures on Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Here, what I'm doing is doing a line-by-line -line exegesis. That is to say, we are reading line-by-line, -line, and we're simply wanting to write down at least three things about each one of these characters, beginning with the merchant on page 104. One of the things we should point out about this group, and I've done this intentionally, is that none of the people of this group are religious. Uh, before, we were working with the, some of those religious people, especially that collection of the non-priorists, the monk, the friar, those are all religious, yes. Here, none of these people are affiliated directly with the church, right? Instead, these are, mo uh, these are all pretty much going to be, um, you know, defined more by their economic status. So let's take a look, starting with the merchant. 
on line 280. Let's read along. Just follow along with me. We'll pause periodically. We'll write some things down. There was a merchant with a forking beard and motley dress. High on his horse, he said, upon his head, a Flemish beaver hat, and on his feet, daintily buckled boots. Now, right away, let's just point out that Chaucer is very interested in this merchant, we would call him a businessman today, by virtue of what he wears. And already we can write down in our notes, this merchant is defined by his garments as being kind of showcasing his wealth, right? Notice he will have a nice hat. He will have these really nice boots. He told of his opinions. I'm at line 284. He told of his opinions and pursuits and solemn tones and how he never lost. The sea should be uh, kept free at any cost, he thought, upon the Harwick Holland Range. He was expert at currency exchange. So let's just write this down. He's very interested in keeping the seas open and free because that's how he makes a lot of his money by virtue of ships of import-export, right? Okay. He was expert at currency exchange. This esteemable merchant so had set his wits to work. None knew he was in debt. He was so stately in negotiation, loan, bargain, and commercial obligation. He was an excellent fellow all the same. To tell the truth, I do not know his name. Let's point out two more things about him. This merchant is a savvy businessman. He is so savvy that he can actually be in debt and nobody realizes it. In other words, he's capable of being in debt and people actually think he's mega wealthy. Number two. Uh, Chaucer will point out, I can't remember who this cat's name was. Note this against, at, three, at 3A, note this as paralleled against that he was able to tell us the name of the friar, right? You look above, for example, the line uh, on page 104 to line 279, the friar's name was Herbert, or so it appeared. Here, notice Chaucer says, I can't even remember this cat's name. I can't remember this, this person's name. Now, why that's significant, I'll leave up to you. One observation that's been made in the past is that this merchant kind of thinks of himself as a big shot, but he's, for Chaucer, not so much of a big shot that he can remember even his name, which is already Chaucer's maybe a little bit of a dig, an ironic dig. Let's keep going. An Oxford cleric. <clears throat> now this one, let's just write it down right away. Oxford is a famous school in London, I'm sorry, in England, and uh, a university, and this is our one student. This is the closest representative in Chaucer's entourage to seniors in high school. A little bit older than, than you guys, okay? But he's a student. Now, about this student, students have said some things, and you're going to put those in your notes as well. What about our student? Let's read about him. Again, I'm at, I'm at line 295 and following. By the way, for your notes, I highly, highly recommend that at level one, while you meet these different characters, you jot down where the lines are for those characters. So, for example, you might want to already, if you haven't done it, jot down that 280, lines 280 to 294, is where you get the information for the merchant. Lines 295 and following is where you get the information for the Oxford cleric. Let's go ahead and go to work still uh, with this Oxford cleric. An Oxford cleric, line 295, still a student though, one who had taken logic long ago, was there. His horse was thinner than a rake, and he was not too fat, I undertake, but had a hollow look, a sober stare. The thread upon his overcoat was bare at line 300. So right away, let's just point out a couple of things about our student. His eyes, notice he says, has a, his, his eye has a hollow look. He's thin. His horse is thin. In other words, he is not going to be a student who has a lot of money. Now, for college students, this sounds very familiar. When you go away to college, most of the time, it's one of the age-old things that they say about college students is that they live on virtually nothing, right? Okay, and so he's kind of, his coat is very thin and bare. I'm, at, I'm at, on page 105, line 301. Read it with me. He had found no preferment in the church, and he was too unworldly to make search for secular employment. He does not want to become a religious yet, but he doesn't want to have to go out into the real world and work. In other words, he is like many students today, what we call a professional student. He would far prefer to go to university than he would to have to go out and get a real job and go to work. Let's keep going with him. By his bed, he preferred having 20 books in red and black of Aristotle's philosophy to having fine clothes, 
fiddle or psalm tree. In other words, let's put it in your notes. If he has any money at all, he does not spend it on party, as, as most college students do. He doesn't spend it on buying clothes. He rather would buy books. He has books piled up all around his bed, especially the books of Aristotle's philosophy. In other words, he loves the study of the past. He lives in the present world, but he far prefers the study of the past. Now, whether Chaucer is making fun of this kind of individual or not, we'll leave to you and your ideas. But let's see how he gets on into his discussion of this young student. To having fine clothes, he says, though a philosopher, I'm at line 307, though a philosopher, as I have told, he had not found the stone for making gold. Now, this is Chaucer's ironic observation. He's incredibly brilliant. He can read books out the yin-yang, but he can't figure out how to make a nickel. He doesn't, he hasn't figured out a way to make any money. So in other words, he's really smart, right? But he can't figure out how to get any money, how to find a way to translate all of that brilliance into getting paid something. One or two college students today will, po will possibly say, you know, I went to university. I love the study of Russian literature. I even took degrees in Russian literature. Unfortunately, now I can't find a job to do anything with Russian literature. The obvious question you might ask him would be what? Dude, why did you study Russian literature? Because I really like it. Okay, now this obviously raises one of those questions we'll ask right now at 3B. Since you are seniors and it's a legitimate question because once you graduate, the obvious question everyone's asking you even now is what are you going to major in when you go away to college? We have two options, don't we? Option A, I'm going to major in something that interests me. I don't care what that is, I'm going to major in something I like and that interests me. The option B is, I'm going to major in something that will give me a job and help me to make money. Now obviously there is option C and it's the penultimate goal of all college students. I'm going to choose something that A, I really enjoy and B, I can get paid to, to, to do, you know, an actual job. But there's always this question, what if I'm really good at X, but X doesn't give me any money? Y gets me the money, but I'm not, real, I'm not good at Y, and I don't like it. Now what? Ooh, that's a tough question. And we're here at the, with the Oxford Cleric thinking about it. Whatever money from his friends he took, line 310, he spent on learning or another book and prayed for them most earnestly, returning thanks to them, thus for paying for his learning. In other words, all the money he has goes to learning. Now, we could point out, to not just make fun of our student here, he has a deep passion for learning. Let's write that down about him. And we want to say about him that this is a good thing. He loves learning. He loves to learn new things. His only care was study. And indeed, he never spoke a word more than was need. Formal at that, respectful in the extreme, short to the point, and lofty in his theme, the thought of moral virtue filled his speech, and he would gladly learn and gladly teach. In other words, the only thing he cared about was, let's write it down, virtue. Now, we're going to mention at several points in Chaucer, Plato, the great Greek philosopher, who of course is going to have been the student of Socrates, and then Plato will have been the teacher of Aristotle. And Aristotle is mentioned in our brief thing about brief comments about this student. Plato would always talk about being virtuous, the four great virtues. Let's write them down. Wisdom, not what you know, but how you use it, right? Courage. The third one is Discipline, or sometimes translated out of the Republic as temperance. And then finally, justice, fairness, correctness, rightness. Now, these four virtues, this young um, student, we're told, he really believes in and he tries to live and he challenges others to live as well. It will be somewhat ironic then, let's write this down at 3A, where we relate text to text. It will be somewhat ironic then that Chaucer will decide to introduce the Oxford cleric right after he has introduced the friar, who we're told is not a very nice guy, but kind of unethical, and the merchant, who is only about money. And then all of a sudden we are introduced to this student who is very interested in ideas, very interested in questions. We call these people who are interested in ideas and questions philosophers. 
They like to ask questions that are sometimes very difficult to answer, but kind of fun to think about, right? A philosopher. So, for example, a philosophic observation from a famous uh, Zen cone. I dreamed I was a butterfly, and then I awoke and wondered if I was a butterfly dreaming I was a human. I dreamed I was a butterfly, and then I awoke from my dream and wondered if I was a butterfly dreaming I was a human. Hmm. These are the kinds of things our Oxford student would write down. He would say, oh, oh, Mr. Ricky, can you please say that one more time? I want to make sure I got that one written down. He would write it on a piece of paper. He would stick it up in his school locker. He wouldn't have pictures of gorgeous girls in their underwear in his locker. He'd have a quote like this or a comment like this. And then every day he'd look at it. And then he'd think about it. And then he'd want to come in and talk about it. And his pals around him would be like, you need to get a real life, son. So what is wrong with you? That's a stupid thing, and who cares whether you're human or butterfly? And he would say, no, 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 i got to think about this. How do I know that I'm human and not actually a butterfly dreaming I'm a human? Because dreaming is like, uh, and, and, you know, and his friends are, you can kind of get the sense. Everybody kind of does one of these numbers around him like, uh, okay. But he does beg a really interesting question. Remember the point of all of this. The Oxford cleric's going to tell a story. I wonder what kind of story he will tell. Hmm. This will make us, as readers of the general prologue, want to flip forward and say, I wonder if I've got a story by the Oxford cleric, the student, and I wonder what kind of story that it is. Let's keep going. On page 105, we now will meet a sergeant at the law. Okay, now we might think of him today as involved in jurisprudence, involved in legal matters, and that kind of thing. We might think of him as a little bit more like, a, uh, like an official of the law or, or a policeman of a kind. So let's take a look here. A sergeant at the law who paid his calls, wary and wise, for clients at St. Paul's, there also was of noted excellence. Discreet he was, a man to reverence, or so it seemed. Now, let's just point this out. This is the hard part about reading Chaucer. This is the hard part about having a friend who is always ironic. So, for example, you walk up in the morning and you had your hair, you know, cut. Right? You're a girl and you had your hair cut and you got a new outfit on. This is a haircut and an outfit you're a little bit worried about, but you've decided looking at yourself in the mirror in the morning, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to go to school and I'm going to wear it and I'm going to be confident and wear it. And you walk up to your friend and your friend goes, ah, nice outfit. Now the words were, nice outfit. The tone she used was, ah. And now in your mind, you're like, is she, is, she, is she complimenting me or is she like jacking with me? And so you, you kind of smooth, maybe you, you what, do, 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 I, do I look okay? Yeah, you look great. Now you really don't know. Now you're like, okay, I look great means I look great or I look great means I look like an idiot and I better skip first hour and go home and change. This is the problem with Chaucer. He will sometimes say things like what you just read. See, some of you read it, but you didn't really pay very close attention to it. So go back and look at it again. Notice it said, we're told, a sergeant of the law, line 321 there was, of noted excellence. In other words, he was a really good guy. But the problem with Chaucer is he said that about the friar. He was a noble pillar to his order. He said that about several other people that you clearly know he's being sarcastic or satiric or ironical about when he says he was a really great guy. So it always makes you wonder. Notice, he continues, discreet he was. In other words, he can do things and get away with it. A man to reverence, in other words, somebody you should respect. But notice at line 324 of 323, or so it seemed. And now all of a sudden it makes you wonder, right? The same thing was said about our merchant. In other words, he'll say this several times. He'll say, yeah, this is a guy that you should totally respect, or so it seemed. Which leads you to wonder, well, is Chaucer supporting this guy? As in saying he is a good guy, your dress looks nice today, meaning it, or is he rather being sarcastic? And this is, of course, the problem with sarcasm and people who are sarcastic. Maybe you have a friend like this, and you're always wondering, dude, are you, like, serious right now? Or are you, like, just messing with me? Of course, as many students have pointed out, the worst uh, thing with these kinds of people is when they text. Because, oh, nice look today. You can, you can hear that in their voice. But if they text you, oh, nice look today, right? 
in text, you read it and you go, okay, so are, are they like making fun? Are they like serious? And so you have to text back and go, are you like, are you like for real? Are you, are, are you just messing with me or what? See how that works? It, when you're reading it, it's always hard to know. Chaucer, let's put it in our notes at 2B. Chaucer knew exactly what he was doing. This is why we call him a genius poet. He knew exactly what he was doing when he plays these kind of games. And he makes you as a reader go, I wonder if he's legit or he's not legit. And obviously it makes you want to read more about it. It also makes you want to listen to his story because when Chaucer, Chaucer will have a story by any of these guys. He will always have a specific prologue where the individual will introduce himself. Here Chaucer is introducing the, uh, these people. But in the specific prologues, like when we look, for example, at the prologue for the partner's tale, the partner's prologue is an introduction to himself. There we're really going to find out what the partner is actually like. He's a vicious, holy, vicious man. He will say about himself. Let's keep going. I'm at page 105 now. Um, and I'm at lines uh, 323 or so. Or so it seems. His sayings were so wise. He often had been justice of Assisi. By letters, patent, and in full commission, his fame and learning and his high position had won him many a robe and many a fee. In other words, he's able to make money, right, through use of the law. There was no such conveyancer as he. All was fee simple to his strong digestion. In other words, he is a lawyer that likes to make a dollar bill. Now, this is funny because we have lots of lawyer jokes today, and many of them go back to this time. When you have Chaucer who suggests this is a guy who knows how to use the law to make bank, to make money. Why? Because he can get away with it. Because there are people who don't know the law, and so they need his help, and so he's able to collect fees and the like, right? Not one conveyance could be called in question. Nowhere there was so busy a man as he, but was less busy than he seemed to be. This is a fascinating idea. He will be a lawyer who looks a lot busier than he really is. He always appears to be going somewhere.